Modern Melbourne is a series that documents the extraordinary practice of our most important architects and designers and looks at their lasting impact on Melbourne. Today we speak with Maggie Edmund. Maggie Edmund has been working as an architect for over 50 years. Graduating from the University of Melbourne in the late 60s, Maggie's journey through architecture has been both expansive and diverse. As one half of the award-winning practice Edmund and Corrigan, Maggie worked alongside the late Peter Corrigan on a rich variety of projects across Melbourne, from late modern houses to highly influential public buildings, including heritage, renovation and reuse projects. In 2023, Maggie had two important recognitions bestowed on her. She was retrospectively awarded the Australian Institute of Architects 2003 gold medal, originally awarded to Peter Corrigan alone, and the Victorian Enduring Architecture Award was named after her. Maggie Edmund, thanks for joining me in this wonderful room here, the Academic Centre at Newman College at the University of Melbourne, where you studied, of course, and we'll come back to that in a bit later. But today I wanted to talk about your journey through architecture and your story. Um, I wanted to go back, first of all, to your childhood. Design has been something you've always been surrounded by, and you lived in some significant houses as a child, and your mother was also in uh, the design world. I, I could say that my childhood was all about design, all about space, all about colour, and the interaction between all of those, the houses I lived in, a grounds and a board? A grounds and a board with a couple in between. Uh, apartments initially. The grounds building was Quamby in Turak. During that time my parents looked at so many houses looking for their dream house but narrowing it down to the bayside suburbs of Beaumaris and Black Rock where there was a, a bevy of very contemporary modernist houses being built and the streets were not made and the beach was close by. They lucked in with a Robin Boyd house on Beach Road and also during that time my parents were both working in the city and I had a childhood in the city as well as in the residential area. They were in fashion, they had a showroom in Flinders Lane and a workroom on the first floor of the Block Arcade in Collins Street. And my childhood memories were of walking from one to the other, taking rolls of fabric, sometimes taking garments. I felt like I was part of the city, I had a, a city imprint I knew what streets were what and where places were. And I was under 10. So it was a childhood as much about the houses I lived in as about the city that was the centre of Melbourne. And that's where your interest in architecture started, and through those houses, through your parents working in fashion and through that very urban experience of Melbourne. I was embedded in it. Uh, Passion might have come from a book called The Queen's Doll's House, uh, a pretty little book that dissected the Queen's actual doll house. It had plans, it had, well, it was a cross section of the house, and lots of little bits of furniture, and, uh, and that stayed with me for quite a while. It was, I didn't have the doll's house, it was the book and the pictures of the doll's house. That and the just all the memories of all the places that we went to. So Maggie here, the Academic Centre at Newman College, um, a little crystal really in this sort of wonderful garden landscape, which the, the Griffins of course contributed to significantly. What were some of the reflections of this project? I remember uh, being in the office uh, and there just being hundreds of models of it floating around. I recall that this building had more options for the final design than just about any other project in the office. But the project was 
for both Newman College and St Mary's. At the time there was a big fence between the two single gender colleges and the building was symbolic of the taking down of the fence and for both colleges to embrace the world of ideas and the world of literature and the world of togetherness. So we had the, the rectors of both colleges together with the patrons for the building coming to our shabby little office, three floors up, and we worked with them in a very special way to have this building. And at the heart of it is this wonderful atrium space, which is incredibly generous um, and a wonderful space to, to be in. It really holds the whole project together. The interior works in its own way and the exterior talks to the Griffin College and to a certain extent to the St Mary's building as well. Eventually you end up studying architecture course here at the University of Melbourne. Was that an exciting time to study and what, what influences did that expose you to? Well, there were some aspects of it that were a little bit on the downside, like the architecture school facility that we studied in. And I remember probably three, four years into the course, the students embarked on a fundraising campaign to finish the building. And there were some very clever minds within the school. And we went out to the heads of industry, the heads of commercial enterprises, and had a, a series of lunches. And we got the big wigs coming to lunch and seeing the impoverished state of our building and raised a fair amount of money, just tapping on the shoulders of people who would one day be our clients. And were there a lot of other female students at the time studying architecture here? Uh, very few. I think there was a ratio of one to five. It was a great time for competitions. It was a great time for government instrumentalities giving out work. It was a time when a, the public works department was looking out instead of looking in and gave significant commissions to architects. Sounds like it might have been better back then. I think it would have been better back then for not having to go out and find clients. The clients were there, the jobs were there. More, more faith in the young profession. It was, I think, how the governments and how the local councils saw projects being delivered. They looked at the architects. And of course, the late 60s, you know, you often hear a lot about the late 60s and a time of big societal change. Was the architecture profession just sort of steady as she goes, sort of not feeling that same cultural change? The profession was like the other professions. Um, I remember we were told that if you have an architecture practice, you must have three partners. One partner would be the design architect. One partner would be the office manager uh, and the th third partner would do lunch. The business, the get, business. The, get the work. And get the work. Weirdly, that, that adage was still floating around when I graduated as an idea, um, as, a, as a success. Obviously, you didn't do that. Uh, almost. Almost. Almost, yes. When Peter asked me if I'd join him in a practice. He said, oh, there's one other person coming in too. It was almost Edmund and Corrigan and somebody else. And somebody else, yes. Who was the somebody else? Somebody else was Brian Burr. Right. Who decided that he'd go back to New York and do his superb renderings for the great architects of the US rather than work with Edmund and Corrigan. And you talked about that desire to go overseas. You didn't, you didn't do that so much. You stayed here and you started working in offices in Melbourne after graduating. Who did you work for and was that, was that influential? After graduation, I had two little children right. to look after. It wasn't until I'd had the children for a couple of years that I put my foot down and said, I have to work. 
I'd been working on the board at home, working on the kitchen table. And at the time, childcare centres just did not exist. There was a childcare centre at Melbourne University, and the two girls were accepted there, and I went to work for a firm called Meldrum and Partners, that then became Meldrum Burrows. And it was five years of working and then being sacked and then working again and being sacked again as the economic situation in the country went up and down. And this is now in the early first half of the, of the 70s and at a certain point you started, you were doing, already doing work of, on your own as well at that time um, and then you started independently practising? Uh, yes, there was a, a bevy of residential projects at the time as well as working in the big office uh, and then Peter arrived back. From the US where he'd been studying and, and working, so this is around 74 and then Edmund and Corrigan came started into being. In, started in 75 and straight into Little Latrobe Street in the city. I brought a couple of projects in. Peter had a, a burgeoning project out in Keysborough, which soon grew and kept us going for about four years. Multiple buildings down at Keysborough, everything from the parish house to the chapel to a school. To a childcare centre, to a old people's accommodation. Uh, it was almost a lifetime of work in one project. There wasn't exactly a balance when the firm started. Peter having come from seven years in the US working with some of the greatest architects that have ever been, uh, sitting at the feet of other great architects as a student. And I was coming from a background of domesticity and uh, inner suburban anger. So the balance was an imbalance. I, I, n I never saw things quite like Peter. When Peter designed something, he designed it and it stayed as his design. And when I designed something, I felt I was designing in a much more mannered and orderly way. There were two instances where we both submitted our own designs for two projects. The most interesting one was for the Fitzroy City Council. So to be clear, the, the same project and each of you doing a design, so two, do two designs from the same office. The committee right? was given two designs, one from me and one from Peter. Option A and option B. Uh, Peter never came to present his. I had to present his and mine. Uh, mine was the one that was chosen and built, but Peter's was the one that was going to be on the front cover of every architecture magazine in the country. I think that showed how I saw architecture early on. Later, I would try and imbue every little project I did with something that was extraordinary. One of those projects you brought into Edmund and Corrigan when it started was the Patford House in Fitzroy, which is a house I've always loved. Um, and this is a great little offset concrete block house. It's very generous by today's standards. Published, of course, in Norman Day's little book in around 75, uh, Modern Houses, Melbourne. Tell us a little bit about that house, because I've always thought it was a real gem. The client had been the mayor of Fitzroy, the block could have had uh, five townhouses on it. It broke every heritage rule that we abide by now. It was set on the diagonal, it was set away from the boundaries, it was built of concrete block. It's still there. Yeah, it's in great condition as well. It's, it's survived all these years. And the original clients are still there. And this was a house finished in 74, 75? Yes. 
It's a great little house and Norman Day makes a similar point around it breaking a whole lot of heritage rules. I did want to talk a bit about heritage because I know early in your career, I think before the formation of Edmund Corrigan, you were involved in some of the early heritage studies in South Melbourne because in that period in the 70s, we're going through a bit of a heritage revolution in Melbourne. We're beginning to stop knocking things down and beginning to appreciate what we have. What was that work in South Melbourne like at the time? That was a Yunkin Freeman project. They were asked by the council to do a conservation study of South Melbourne. And my job was to draw all the streetscapes which were going to be in their report. It was the first heritage conservation study that was done in the inner suburbs. And it led to all the buildings and the streetscapes being graded and then to the controls that led to, well, most of it was there. There were very few that had been knocked down in South Melbourne. The real problem was over in Fitzroy, in North Fitzroy, and the Brooks Crescent fight. Are you involved in that? And I was. Uh, I made the big model, which featured in all the publications. The publication I remember best is the little woman in Brooks Crescent with the gun in her hand, standing at the front porch. <laughs> and a slogan like, keep out. <laughs> <laughs> did that campaign ultimately work? It did. The buildings were saved? The buildings were saved. So Maggie, that work, early work, particularly uh, places like Keysborough, St Joseph's in Mount Albert North, there was a real familiarity in the architectural language there. There was a sense that it was both kind of ordinary and extraordinary at the same time. How did that approach come about? It seemed incredibly welcome, welcoming and apt for the time. Oh, it was driven by passion. Passion permeated everything that we were doing at the time. The church, as a client, was very receptive to that passion. The, the faith, the trust that came from the clients, the various parish priests in the various churches that we worked on, uh, was, was uh, symbiotic and quite beautiful. The buildings reflected that. And obviously they were successful, people liked them. That, that was part of the brief. Yes. But it was, it, I guess it was unusual in the sense that it was both work that was highly uh, liked by its users, but also influential in the profession more broadly. It was a rare coming together of those two things. You don't often see that even today. Well, there aren't many buildings that have to go through a rigorous assessment of what every part of the building means. Uh, and the requirement for all those church buildings was to, to reflect the meaning uh, and in some cases to go beyond the meaning, imbue the meaning with a more contemporary vision. Mm. Uh, I think there was a, a, new, a new language that was coming out of the church at the time and, and those church buildings were able to reflect the new directions of the church. Mm. So Edmund and Corrigan uh, starts and very quickly becomes very successful, um, both in terms of lots of house projects, lots of these community projects. Um, and it seems now that the whole um, industry, the discipline, the critical scene was changing quite radically and there was a a famous uh, exhibition, the Four Melbourne Architects Show. And there's a great photo of uh, you and, and Peter Corrigan, of course, Greg Burgess, Peter Crone, Norman Day. It must have been an exciting time to sort of find a sort of cohort of people all interested in a similar idea about kind of exciting um, architecture that's sort of reacting to the stuff that came immediately before it. Would that be fair to say? 
The, the show was about ideas in architecture, whether they were built ideas or ideas that stayed on the drawings. It had never been done before. In terms of the office itself, in terms of Edmund and Corrigan, um, was it difficult holding a busy office together? Um, I think the office ran itself. It was up three flights of stairs, so it was sort of ivory tower stuff, but being where it was in the middle of the city and next to RMIT, there was a constant parade of different people up and down the staircase. And then inside the office, it was very open. We didn't have a receptionist. People just walked in and were confronted with the staff on the drawing boards and Peter with a hangover and, and, and I sat upstairs in the mezzanine and waved the wand. <laughs> it was a wonderful studio atmosphere in there, tall space, wonderfully lit. It felt like something from another time. We built it. Uh, there was no money in the budget for air conditioning. We had a gigantic north-facing window, which fortunately was shaded by the 50-storey apartment buildings that started to be built to our north. And last I heard, it was being used by young architects to kickstart their practices and share the facilities. And so maybe it'll get an Enduring Architecture Award one day. <laughs> the Maggie Edmund Enduring Architecture Award. Maggie Edmund. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that. Um, a project I really wanted to talk a bit about, which is a lesser known Edmund Corrigan project, is the Fairfield Amphitheatre, um, right on the banks of the Yarra, near the Fairfield Boat House. Beautiful, underappreciated project. This is a favourite of yours, I think, Maggie. How did that project come about and what was that trying to do? It came via the the work that Peter was doing in the theatre, an arts community officer in the Northcote City Council who had been working with the Greek community, had a vision for an amphitheatre space, a Greek amphitheatre space by the Yarra. And we were given the commission by the council. It was one of a few projects that had a guardian angel hovering above and it went very smoothly if you, through all the processes. It was built under a government red scheme. The bluestone came from the local streets. The streets had been paved in bluestone from the local quarry. So it was very much a, a material that sat comfortably next to the river. It feels like it's just come out of the site, like it's so well placed into that bank. It feels like it's always been there. And it was designed to the same proportions as the theatre at Epidavros in Greece, with a magical centre to the stage where when you stand and talk, anyone can hear you from the top rung down. I did it recently, it really, do, it really does work. It's, 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 it's pretty much a landscape project. There's almost no building, there's a little kiosk. There's a long, long standing interest you've had in, in, in landscape. This project seems a really good example of that. The, the Greek amphitheatres stopped at the edges. Well, they, they came round almost closing the circle, but this one tails off into the landscape. So it's got a, a landscaped edge to the lower levels. And in doing that, it, it sits more comfortably into the, the landscape and the, the trees and the topography. It's a beautiful, beautiful project. I want to zoom forward into the 1990s now because that seemed to be a real second peak for the, for the office um, as start doing work on lots of fire stations, at the showgrounds, at RMIT, and um, at the now tragically demolished Ringwood Library, um, which I thought was a fantastic 
project, a really serious investigation into how to do a public building in the suburbs and a public space, a landscape and a building. What's it like having a project demolished after only, you know, a couple of decades? Very sad. Uh, it innovated an existing shopping centre. It showed how buildings other than supermarkets and department stores uh, can bring a community together. And we hoped that it was going to be there forever, but commercial moors and the commercial aspirations must have looked at the building and decided it wasn't generating enough money. So out it came and replaced by something that did make money. Yeah, it's a real tragedy because it, it, it might not have even been 20 years that it was, was, was there. Um, obviously it would have been good for it to have some form of heritage protection. Um, I think St Joseph's um, has has that now. Um, are there other projects, Edmund and Corrigan projects, that have heritage protection yet? The church at Keysborough, Keysborough has got the heritage gong and the amphitheatre. Oh, the amphitheatre does? Yes. Oh, great. It's safe. It's safe. <laughs> I don't think it needed a, a heritage protection to, to keep it. It would take a mammoth effort to get rid of that one. Yeah, it's very much in the ground. Um, of course, in the 90s, we also saw the work at RMIT Building 8, which was a complex project, both architecturally and in terms of use, lots of student groups and departments. How was that project tackled and how did it change the office? It was the largest project I think the office had done. It was a four-year project and we did nothing else but Building 8 in that time. Building 8 started off as an extension above the John Andrews three-level building in Swanston Street, notable for its glass block panels in a zigzag form. The original building can still be read only just with the other 12 levels that went above it being much more responsive to the city and the street pattern. It grew and grew as the support for tertiary education in the country increased. Uh, even when the builder was on site, we'd be given new instructions to put another couple of floors on. And then a year later, another couple of floors again. So as the design architects for the project, we worked continuously on design, even while the building was being constructed. More broadly, Maggie, is there a project that you would like to be remembered for? And why is that? I think that the three projects that Peter and I worked together on would be this one, the Athen House, and the amphitheatre. They're my favourites. Each of those have a unique relationship to what the office has stood for and to the clients that we worked with. Well, the project you mentioned there, of course, we're sitting in the, the academic centre here at Newman College. Newman College is hallowed ground in the architectural world, of course, the work of the Marion Marnie uh, and Walter Burley Griffin here as well. Was it, as someone who's an alumni of the University of Melbourne, was it rewarding to come back and work at this site? The selection process for the project uh, wasn't driven by alumni, it was driven by husband and wife architecture firms and the shortlisted firms were all husband and wife practices. That was the intention from that the... That was the intention. Because of, because of Mary Marnie and Walter Burley Griffin's legacy? To move forward with a similar combination of ideas coming, emanating from the partnership. What a great procurement strategy. Um, 
And the Athen House, of course, you mentioned a very successful house out in Mombolk. Um, that would have been around 87, one of the key 80s projects. Late 80s. Yes. yes. There were a lot of significant houses in that period. These became quite big and quite complex. They became little cities almost in them in themselves. It was a, a multi-generational house. There was a, mm. a wing for the children. There was a wing for the, the grandparents and a wing for the parents with a communal space that linked all of them. And that program was used in a few more houses that we did. And if the intergenerations weren't there, then there was a flexibility to ensure that they could be there. It's a wonderful house and widely published both in Australia and, and internationally. I think it made it into an edition of Sir Bannister Fletcher's History of Architecture uh, at, one, at one point. I wanted to ask you, Maggie, a bit about um, projects and their legacy. Um, do you think about the projects a lot um, 30 or 40 years after they've been finished? Are they always with you? Yes. <laughs> uh, they're like children. Your children never leave you. Your children are always there. And I think the projects that we have done have lived on like that. And so Joseph uh, Mont Albert's a good example of that now, deconsecrated as a chapel and now a new use. As a university of the third age, and it's rather nice that we've been asked to help a little bit with changes for that building. Very rarely have we lost contact with clients and with the buildings. And that building I think is 40 years old this year and was the first project I think in 2003 to win the Enduring Architecture Medal. That would have been satisfying and it would have been also satisfying this year to have had that medal named after you, Maggie. A lot has happened <laughs> 20 years on. And the Enduring Architecture Medal is a great piece of work because it does help get projects protected, right? It, it has a role in sort of pushing projects out into the consciousness and saying, well, this is an important piece of work. And as well as one building getting the award, or in the case of the national awards, there'd be half a dozen buildings up for assessment. I'd like to see all the ones that are nominated be celebrated, not just the ones that get the award. So if I can influence the juries, I think there should be more written about why architects are nominating the buildings because it, it shows that we do think about the future in our work. It's not just of the moment. Did you consider the future heritage of your projects? Oh, can we step away from heritage as a prescribed requirement for projects and, and think about heritage more in terms of social heritage, uh, a wider urban heritage, not so much as just the piece of architecture. Not just the object. Not just the object. About uh, the fabric that it sits in. I, th I think there's still a, an issue with the way architecture is put on the ground that we're not given enough leeway to control what's around the building. We work more with landscape professionals and we work more with uh, those we should be working with, the indigenous peoples, to make that happen. But I think there's much more scope to ensure that that heritage is stronger and taken more seriously. Agreed. Um, now, of course, the office started in about 74, 75. It is almost 50 years old. Um, and amazingly, the office is still going. You're still working day to day. The phone's still ringing. The phone is still ringing. What keeps you going, Maggie? Architecture is most of me. <laughs> I don't 
don't think I wake up any morning without a thought about architecture foremost as I lie in the bath, ruminating on the day. Uh, Peter used to sit in the shower and ruminate on the day. Uh, it's, it's been a, a life's passion. Were there some major influences internationally in terms of practising as a female architect in Australia? Uh, they weren't very overt. You had to look hard to find them. But Julia had a single woman practice and she built over a thousand projects in her career. The most famous one being San Simeon, the sprawling project in Los Angeles for Randolph Hearst. Uh, so I set out to eclipse the number of projects that she had done. And did you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Over a thousand jobs mm. through the office. Yes. Wow. <laughs> this year um, in Kirsten Thompson's gold medal address, um, uh, in the, which has happened in the NGV Great Hall, at one point, uh, Kirsten posed the question when thinking about the complexities of projects and practice, what would Maggie do? Everyone knew which Maggie she was referring to and you were in the audience. Um, it suggested that your role in architecture has been both, I guess, a designer and an organiser. Is that how you've seen your role over the career? I look back to my parents for that one. The mother was a bit of a bohemian beatnik. Uh, she was the style conscious, design conscious, bit of a larrikin. She and Peter got on very well. My father was of Vienna, very mild mannered, very orderly, very inquiring and, and quiet. He had that Viennese charm about him. I think I've taken from both of them, and but they come out separately, they haven't mixed, so I can switch from one to the other. Which is a good combination of skills to have as an architect. I also wanted to briefly mention, Maggie, that over the years in the profession, you've had a lot of involvement just outside of the office as well. Um, committees, boards, teaching. Why are all those other things important in, in being a kind of architect? Looking back on them, uh, there was something evangelistical about it uh, to immerse oneself in decision making in institutions like the Zoological Board, the State Film Centre, Deakin University. It was like being on the ground for the profession, being at the coalface of decision-making about projects and so a bit like an ambassador. You have to be in the room. You have to be in the room to get the message across. Uh, and I recall that I would strive to make sure that if they made decisions about who was going to design the buildings, they would be the right decisions and they were made democratically and instead of just getting the same old architect to do the next building and the next building and because they were comfortable with that particular firm. Mm. But I wasn't the only one doing that. There were other architects and, and women architects. I think the zoo board had a progression of four or five women architects after me, always there on the board. Advocating for good design. Yes. Um, back in 2003, your late partner Peter Corrigan was awarded the um, Institute of Architects Gold Medal, the, the highest honour for an architect in Australia. Uh, 20 years later, in uh, late 2023, this has been formally amended and now awarded to both you and Peter, appropriately. Um, and it was great to see this oversight corrected. 
what were your feelings about being on the stage in Canberra recently and, and accepting this belated honour? The jury was undivided in its conclusion that the work celebrated in the 2003 gold medal was that of the team. And so it is with great pleasure that I announce the 2003 gold medal for the event. I was sitting in the front row of the auditorium at the National Gallery of Australia, sitting next to Auntie Violet, who was there to give the welcome to country for the occasion. And Auntie Violet finished her welcome and came off the stage and I was then invited to come up and I was given the gold medal and I couldn't see the audience. The lights were on the stage, not on the, the auditorium. And I gather everybody stood up and clapped. You got a standing ovation. A standing ovation. Uh, I hope I, I did all the people who had worked to change the gold medal uh, their, their due, and I hope I did women in architecture a service. I hope I did the profession of architecture a service too, to show that the Institute is looking out and looking beyond. Well, it's a great recognition of a life spent in architecture. Thank you, Maggie Edmund. Thank you, Stuart.